With the Kofan Valley secured, Alexander left Taxiles and pressed deeper into the subcontinent, making for the Hyphasis River. To do so, however, Alexander would have to pass through the territories of numerous Indian kings, having to either defeat or subjugate them in order to protect his rear. This portion of Alexander's campaign, from Taxila to the Hyphasis, would prove to be one of the most difficult of Alexander's career. It brought his empire to its greatest extent, and was marked by one of his toughest yet most brilliant victories, but would also push his men to their most extreme breaking point. Your own victories are worth mentioning too, soon to come to pass in our sponsor, World of Warships. If you don't know already, World of Warships is a free-to-play naval combat game on PC, in which you, either on your own or with a division of your friends, take part in naval combat on over 40 realistic naval battlefields. They've just updated the game with stunning water effects and textures to bring it even closer to the real thing, and there are dynamic weather effects that not only look beautiful, but factor into your naval strategy. But the main feature is of course the ships. Choose from over 300 historic ships, including battleships, destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, and even submarines, all lovingly modelled in full detail. The game gets monthly updates with new ships, nations, cosmetics, or ship classes, so there's always more to see if the constant action of the tense 12 versus 12 engagements wasn't already enough. By the way, we said it's a PC game, but if you prefer, you can now play on consoles. So give World of Warships a go, but make sure to use our link in the description to get the game for free, and after you register, use our code BRAVO to grab a load of exclusive rewards right at the start. At the time, much of North India, where Alexander eventually planned to campaign, consisted of the powerful Nanda Empire, ruled by Dana Nanda. His empire stretched from Odisha in the east to the Hyphasis River in the west, and was said to be able to field hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Before confronting this empire, however, Alexander needed to subdue the numerous kingdoms that lay between the Taxila and Hyphasis in order to secure his rear. Emissaries had already been sent to the local kings, notably Abyssaris and Porus, requesting tribute and that they meet Alexander on the borders of their kingdoms. Abyssaris submitted to Alexander, but Porus, king of the Pauravas, was more stubborn. While little is known about Porus, it is clear from Greek sources that he was a formidable ruler. He was a renowned warrior, brave, strong, and standing and intimidating seven feet tall, and his physical attributes were matched by his intelligence, Porus being described as a wise, cunning, and respected leader. In response to Alexander's request, Porus replied that he would indeed meet him on his border, but that he would bring an army with him. Never one to refuse a challenge, Alexander, amid the monsoon season, marched to the Hydaspes with a force of approximately 30 to 40,000 infantry, 7,000 cavalry, and 5,000 Taxilian allies. On the opposite bank, they saw the Pauravas army, 35,000 infantry, 4,000 cavalry, 300 chariots, and approximately 100 elephants. At their head, riding a large elephant, was Porus himself. Porus had chosen his battlefield well. The Hydaspes was wide and fast-flowing, meaning that any contested crossing, as Alexander had done at the Granicus, would be near impossible. He had further capitalized on his position by stationing his elephants in front of his battle line, knowing that their very presence would spook Alexander's horses and make any crossing even more difficult. Time was also on Porus's side. Abyssaris, though he had previously submitted to Alexander, had also promised to reinforce Porus. Alexander needed a quick victory, but with a frontal attack out of the question, a more cunning strategy would be needed. Alexander made his camp in clear view of Porus's men and sent out foraging parties. At the same time, he sent numerous scouting parties up and down the river, ensuring that they made plenty of noise while doing so. Porus, in turn, kept the majority of his force drawn up opposite Alexander's camp, but sent his own troops to mirror Alexander's scouts along the riverbank. The charade continued for days, Alexander's men bringing supplies into their camp and his scouting parties riding along the river with Porus's men mirroring their movements. Eventually, Porus became convinced that Alexander would wait for the monsoon season to end and was only scouting for future landing spots and stopped sending his men to parallel Alexander's movements. This was precisely what Alexander had been hoping for. 
Alexander had already identified his crossing point, approximately 18 miles upstream from his camp and densely wooded. The thick foliage had provided enough cover for Alexander's men to assemble rafts and boats in the area in preparation for his crossing, Alexander's feigned scouting missions hiding their movements. With these preparations made, and Porus lured into a false sense of security, Alexander made his move. He ordered the campfires to be kept burning, had his usual guard stationed outside his tent, had even dressed one of his companions as a double, and then, during the night, slipped away towards the crossing with 6,000 infantry, including phalangites, silver shields, hypaspists, agrianians, archers, and 5,000 cavalry. Thanks to Alexander's numerous feints, any movement seen by Porus's army gave no concern. Craterus, meanwhile, was left in command of the majority of the army in camp, with Meliga and a force of mercenaries stationed between the camp and the crossing. The initial strategy was that Craterus's force would maintain the facade of the full army being encamped. Meliga's force would act as a further distraction by threatening a crossing, while Alexander would make the real crossing in secret and surprise Porus's force, hoping to lure the elephants towards him. Craterus would then also cross and catch Porus's army in a pincer, Meliega crossing where possible to join the fight. With his plans in place, Alexander's force prepared to cross. A thunderstorm swept through, threatening to derail the mission, but it soon died down, the heavy rain and cloud providing more cover for Alexander. His men crossed the Hadaspes to the assigned landing point. Upon completing the crossing, however, Alexander realized that he had made a mistake. What he had considered the opposite bank was in fact a large island, separated from Porus's bank by another channel of the river. As quickly as they could, Alexander's men brought the rafts and boats across the island to cross this channel, but by the time they made foot on the other bank, it was nearing dawn and they were spotted by Porus's scouts before Alexander's force could properly assemble. Though Alexander's previous maneuvers had allowed him to cross unopposed, his plan had been based on him having the element of surprise, and that advantage was now lost. He would now have to face Porus's force head on, with only a quarter of his army. Porus quickly sent 2,000 cavalry and 120 chariots under the command of his son to engage Alexander's force while they completed the crossing. To buy time for his infantry, Alexander sent his horse archers to engage the chariots, splitting his own cavalry into numerous squadrons to surround the Poravids, and charged. Fortunately for Alexander, the heavy rain had made much of the terrain almost impossible for Porus's chariots to maneuver in, and his men quickly gained the upper hand killing 400, including Porus's son, before they retreated to the main force. They had, nonetheless, delayed Alexander enough for Porus to make his own preparations. Leaving a small force to contest any crossing from Craterus, Porus turned the majority of his army to Alexander, cavalry and chariots on the flanks, infantry in the center, and with his elephants in front, intending to use them to break Alexander's infantry formation. With Porus's army drawn up for battle and Alexander's initial plan of surprising Porus shattered, he recalled his cavalry, waited for his infantry to catch up, and formulated a new strategy. Alexander knew that the elephants would be the biggest threat to his army, and so, rather than attack Porus's center immediately, he planned to crush Porus's cavalry on the flanks first. In order to do so, Alexander split his more numerous cavalry into two parts. The majority, under his personal command, would attack Porus's left, aiming to lure all the enemy cavalry to that side of the battle, which would allow the second part, under Coenus, to flank around Porus's right and attack the Paravas cavalry from the rear. The infantry, meanwhile, would advance slowly, but with strict orders not to engage until they saw that Coenus's movement had been successful. After giving his men time enough to recover their breath from the river crossing, Alexander began his attack, launching 1,000 horse archers at Porus's left. While the Poravian cavalry was thrown into disarray by the storm of arrows, Alexander led his companions and the bulk of his cavalry around to hit their flank. Just as Alexander had planned, Porus diverted his cavalry from the right to reinforce his left. Coenus now made his move flanking the Indian right and circling around to hit Porus's cavalry in the rear. 
the Paurevian horse, attacked from two sides, soon broke under the pressure, retreating towards the safety of the elephants in the center. Porus began to move his elephants to attack Alexander's cavalry, to try and save his left, but Alexander's horses were easily able to pull back before the slower elephants could engage them. Meanwhile, Alexander's phalanx had now closed in on the Indian center, attacking the mass of infantry, elephants, and scattered cavalry. The elephants charged the phalanx, but Alexander had already prepared his men for fighting the beasts. Where possible, the phalanx gave ground to absorb their charge, thrusting their long sarissas at the mahouts or aiming for the elephants' eyes. Agrianians and light infantry were also sent against them, some attacking with javelins, some chopping at the elephants' trunks and legs with axes and swords. Nevertheless, the elephants caused heavy casualties, trampling many, picking up and throwing men with their trunks, and impaling others on their tusks. It was a scene of utter carnage. The elephants though, many of whom were wounded and terrified, soon began to desperately try and escape the chaos, rampaging back through Porus' infantry and causing still more casualties. Alexander and the cavalry, meanwhile, kept attacking the sides and rear of Porus's center, until Porus's army was completely surrounded, the phalanx pushing from the front, Alexander and the cavalry from the rear, and the panicking elephants running a mark in the middle. Under such fierce pressure, Porus's men gradually started to break, fleeing through the gaps in Alexander's cavalry. By this point in the battle, Craterus and Melega had crossed the river with their portions of the army, pursuing the routing forces. Though some of the Pauravas had broken, others still fought on, Porus among them. Surrounded by his personal guard, he fought bravely for as long as any of his men did, throwing javelins from atop his elephant. He was wounded numerous times in the fighting though, at one point almost losing consciousness due to blood loss, and was eventually compelled by his men to retreat, the battle now clearly being lost. Alexander, however, had been impressed by Porus's determination and bravery, and sent men after him, compelling him to surrender. Wounded as badly as he was, it is debatable how much say Porus truly had. Nevertheless, he gave himself up and was brought to Alexander. Upon being asked how he wished to be treated, Porus famously replied, Treat me as a king. His request was granted. Porus was treated by Alexander's best physicians and was allowed to rule as a vassal king under Alexander. Alexander later even gave more land to Porus to rule. The battle had been one of Alexander's masterpieces, as it displayed his mastery of psychological warfare, as well as feints and logistical knowledge, in effecting a crossing of more than 10,000 men in the night undetected. Once the initial plan had been foiled, Alexander also demonstrated his ability to devise a winning strategy under pressure and in moments. Arian claims Alexander and Porus's losses as 310 and 23,000 respectively, while Diodorus suggests over 1,000 dead for Alexander, Porus suffering 12,000 dead and 9,000 captured. Given the chaotic nature described in all the sources, particularly the role of the elephants, most modern historians tend to agree that Diodorus's figures are more realistic. Among Alexander's casualties was his horse, Bucephalus, who was either killed during the battle or died soon after, possibly from wounds he sustained there. Bucephalus had carried Alexander since boyhood, through numerous campaigns and battles, and his death affected Alexander deeply, the king even founding a city, Bucephala, in his honour. At this point it is worth addressing the myth that Alexander in fact lost the Battle of Hydaspes to Porus. Proponents of this idea point to the fact that Bucephalus died, that Porus was kept as king, and that there are only Greek sources for the battle as evidence for this view. They also cite the account of Justin and the Alexander Romance, both of which claim that Porus and Alexander dueled each other on the battlefield, Porus killing Bucephalus in this version. The arguments are weak. Justin's reliability leaves much to be desired, as his work is a summary of a previous more detailed account, and varies wildly in its accuracy. The Alexander Romance is even more problematic. Though some parts of it are rooted in historical sources, it was adapted by many cultures over centuries, eventually becoming more like a myth or fairy tale of Alexander's life than true history. The Alexander Romance, for instance, 
claimed that Bucephalus was a man-eating horse, that Alexander used 24,000 metal elephants at the Battle of Hydaspes, and that Porus used magicians in the battle. To no surprise, the text is largely considered unreliable. It is worth noting, however, that even though both Justin and the Alexander Romance mention Alexander dueling Porus, both sources record the battle as a victory for Alexander, and also add the incorrect but often overlooked detail that Alexander killed Porus during the battle. The other claims are equally easily disproved. While Greek and Roman sources are indeed the only extant sources for the battle, they are unanimous in recording that Alexander won. In comparison, we have no Persian sources for the Battle of Granicus, but such a lack of sources does not count as evidence that the battle was lost. Alexander keeping Porus as king aligns with Alexander's prior treatment of captured rulers and nobility. Mithrenes, Mazaeus, Erasmes, Pratophernes, and Oxyates are all examples of men who directly fought against Alexander, but later surrendered and were either appointed to their previous positions or promoted. As for the death of Bucephalus, although it highlights how hard fought the battle was, the death of a steed says nothing about the fate of the rider, nor the conclusion of the battle. Alexander's Indian campaign did not stop after the Hydaspes, and he was able to push further into the country, further evidencing his victory. Porus was, by all accounts, a talented ruler and brave warrior, worthy of respect and admiration for the feats he really did perform, without needing exaggeration. Claims that Alexander lost the battle are not supported by any academic historian or classicist, and should be labelled what they are – poor history at best, rank propaganda at worst. Following the battle, Alexander advanced beyond the Hydaspes, accepting the surrender of numerous kings in the area, including Abyssaris, giving much of their lands to Porus to govern as a vassal or satrap. The majority of the local peoples submitted to Alexander, but some, notably the Cathaeans, Oxidracians, and Malians, resisted. After resting his army in Porus's lands, Alexander marched on the Cathian capital of Sangala, alongside Porus and 5,000 of his men. After three days' march, Alexander arrived near the city, finding their army, at least 20,000 strong, stationed outside the city on a hill, surrounded by three makeshift walls of wagons. Alexander led the first wave of the attack, dismounted, and fought alongside his companions. They were able to overcome the first line of defenses relatively easily, but the second proved much more difficult. Eventually, though, Alexander's army was able to break through the defenses, forcing the Cathayans to retreat into their city. The city proved to be too large for Alexander to completely encircle, instead deciding to assault the walls with siege towers. The fighting proved to be particularly difficult, with Alexander losing as many as 1,200 men dead or wounded, but he was ultimately successful. Alexander reportedly took 70,000 Cathayans as prisoners and raised Sangala to the ground, possibly as revenge for the comparatively heavy casualties he sustained. For weeks, Alexander's army continued their march inland, suffering from various tropical diseases, snake bites, and other dangers, heading for the Hyphasis River. Beyond this river, Alexander had heard reports of nations such as the Nanda Empire, which had fertile lands and large populations, and were to be the target of Alexander's next phase of his campaign. He had been warned that these nations had colossal armies, totaling in the hundreds of thousands, as well as thousands of elephants. But Alexander was nevertheless determined to press on, confident that he and his army would be able to overcome them. Alexander, however, had made a mistake. He had misjudged the attitude of his army. At the Hyphasis River, they mutinied, refusing to march any further. It was not the first time that his men had shown signs of fatigue. Similar concerns had been voiced following the death of Darius but this was the first time they had point-blank refused to go on. Alexander appealed to them, assuring them that the rumours they had heard regarding the Nanda armies were surely exaggerations. He listed the nations that he and his army had conquered, imploring men to press on further to complete his grand strategy of conquering all of Asia, saying, Glorious are the deeds of those who undergo labour and run the risk of danger, and it is delightful to live a life of valour and to die leaving behind a mortal glory. The speech was met with silence. Alexander encouraged any man to speak their mind, 
saying that anyone who disagreed could feel free to say so. Still, there was silence. Alexander had always been loved by his army, but the fate of Cletus and Callisthenes, who had both spoken out against Alexander, was perhaps still too close a memory. Alexander grew angry and annoyed, declaring, Alone I shall persist in going on. Expose me to the rivers, the beasts, and those nations whose mere names you dread. I shall find men to follow me, deserted though I am by you. Go then back to your homes. Go in triumph after having abandoned your king. Here I shall find the victory of which you despair, or the opportunity for an honourable death. Some of his men began to break down in tears upon hearing this, but still no one said a word. Finally, Coenus, one of Alexander's finest generals, who had recently distinguished himself at the Hydaspes, spoke up for the men. He firstly assured Alexander that he and the men would, in his words, go wherever you order, to fight, to incur danger, at the price of our blood, to hand your name to future generations. If you persist, we, even unarmed, naked and worn out, will follow wherever you desire. Coenus then pointed out, however, that after years of campaigning, their armour and weapons were broken and tattered, and that many were now past their fighting prime. They had lost thousands of comrades over the years, some to battles, some to disease, some to the weather or wild animals. Those that were left, Coenus argued, had earned the right to return home and enjoy the glory and riches that Alexander had brought them. Coenus continued, pointing out that Alexander had already won eternal glory and that he risked losing it all if he pushed on with an army that was starting to weaken. It would be wiser, he reasoned, for Alexander to return to Macedonia, rest his men, and then begin a new campaign with a fresh army. Coenus' speech was greeted with applause and cheers from the men. Furious, Alexander dismissed them and stormed off to his tent. He remained there for two days, hoping that the men's attitude would change. On the third, when it became apparent that they would not relent, Alexander emerged from his tent to perform his regular sacrifices. He proclaimed them to be unfavourable, saying it was a clear message from the gods, and that as a result, he would lead the men home. It was clearly a face-saving act from Alexander, designed to give him an excuse to agree to the men's demands without admitting defeat. But none cared. His men were overjoyed, greeting Alexander with tears and praises, and the latter reconciled with the army. To mark the extent of his campaign, Alexander ordered the construction of twelve large altars, one for each of the Olympian gods. Alexander's campaign, originating in Greece ten years earlier, finally reached its limit at the Hephasis River in Punjab. Alexander had, in Arian's opinion, finally allowed himself to be defeated, not by an enemy but by his own men. Alexander turned his army around and began the march back to the Hadaspes River. Shortly after this, Coenus died. Most sources say it was an illness that killed him, and no source makes any implication that Alexander was involved. Some modern historians, however, do consider it suspicious that Coenus died so soon after publicly disagreeing with Alexander, and suggest that Alexander may have had him killed as he had done with Callisthenes. Nevertheless, the army soon reached the Hydaspes, where a large fleet had been constructed to sail Alexander's army down the river in preparation for the journey home. However, although Alexander's campaign had reached its greatest extent, it was not yet over. The Malians and Oxidracians, who had previously resisted Alexander, inhabited land along the banks of the Hydaspes, and so long as Alexander had an army, there would always be more conquests. Thanks again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Get the game for free via our link in the description. The next episode of our series on Alexander is now in the works and will be released soon, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.